Well, it's great to be here. My name is Danny Flores. I'm with HEB. Um, and this is really a, a huge opportunity for me, being that I was actually part of the first session with GFN back in 2007. And to see it, what it's come to today is amazing. And us knowing, going through everything that we've gone through in the last few years with COVID, um, personally, I just want to tell everybody out here, thank you for everything that you have done for all of your communities. Uh, we know what the food banks have been put up against, um, especially with everything being closed down and how do we feed everybody. And so honestly, uh, as far as HEB is concerned, we thank you um, uh, to, from the bottom of my heart. So if anybody does, who doesn't know HEB, we're a little grocery company down in uh, Texas. Um, we have over about 430 stores within Texas and Mexico. We have over 154,000 employees. Um, our employees, we call them partners because we feel everybody's together and we are a partner in, in, in our everyday dealings with uh, retail and community. And we've been open, our doors opened up in 1905. So we've been, we've been in business for about 118 years. And the best thing that HEB uh, was able to start with was with Florence Butt, knowing that community, that the, the people who were in her community came first. And every time when she had access to food, she would donate to those in her community. And since then, since 1905, HEB has taken that step. So in the years past, we've donated over a billion pounds of food. Last year, we donated over 33 million pounds of food to our communities in Texas and Mexico. And I also have, I'm also blessed to be able to um, oversee that program, our hunger relief program, along with our disaster relief efforts and a few other things uh, that HEB likes to have me play with. Um, but we all know uh, today we're here to talk about supply chain disruptions. We know it's what COVID did. We know about the conflict in Ukraine and the climate change. And really what the, the global cost of living crisis. And in the session, we want to take a deep dive um, into that. And really, I am lucky to be able to share the stage with such a great group of people. And uh, we're going to start with, with Sylvia. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. You want me to introduce myself? Yes, 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 yes. Thank yes. you. So first of all, very honored to be to be here uh, and, and to see people from all different places in the world. It is really, really amazing. So welcome to our beautiful country. Um, I am Silvia Suarez. I am the director for Latin America for sustainability, uh, strategy and marketing. And, uh, and, 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 and currently, uh, also very honored to be the, the honorary president of Pacto por la Comida, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, part of, uh, of, of BAMEX. Um, so I'll pass it over to Juan Carlos. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Dani. Uh, well, I'm Juan Pardo. I work for Nestle Mexico. Um, Mexico is the fifth largest market for Nestle around the world. We are a little bit over a uh, quarter of a million people working for, for Nestle around the world with a little bit over 500 plants. In Mexico, we're a little bit over 15,000 people with 18 plants. And we've been working with, uh, with uh, Banco de Alimentos, uh, I don't know, more than 30 years, I believe. Um, and Nestle has been here in Mexico for a little bit more than 90 years. And well, I'm in charge of corporate affairs for Mexico and a uh, pleasure to have you here in Mexico. Julie. Hi, good morning everybody. I am Julie Yurko and I have the privilege of serving as the president and CEO of Northern Illinois Food Bank. So we are a food bank that serves the suburb and the rural areas of Northern Illinois. If you know where Chicago is, you know where my food bank is. Um, <laughs> that might help ground some folks. Um, we cover 13 counties in Illinois, and it's a population of about 4 million people, of which at any given time, we have about 7 to 10% of that population who are food insecure. I did my math last night to translate our distribution into tons. Um, 
And so we, are, um, we distribute 46 million tons of food every year, of which 65% of that, or about 30 million tons, is donated to us. Um, one of our, our main focus areas is on making sure we're serving our neighbors who are seeking help in ways that empower them making sure they not only have access to food, but they have the food that they need and want. And so supply chain is really, really important to us right now, and I'm delighted to be a part of this panel. I have to say this is my first GFN Leadership Institute. Being so close to Chicago, I've had the privilege of welcoming many food banks from around the country to visit our food bank because of GFN, and I just have to say, just 24 hours or whatever the, the time is within this conference, I am so amazed, I am so humbled. Um, I'm learning so much from all of you, so thank you for having me here today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for being here, Julie. Our new found friend, Elijah, just came in. He's been 24 hours just before he hit the ground, so. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. So my name is Chef Elijah Amuado. I'm the founder and executive director of Food for All Africa. Food for All Africa operates one of the first and largest food bank in West Africa, specifically Ghana. We, our vision has always been to connect excess food within our supply chain to vulnerable families and communities who have mostly had it in the area of having purchasing power. But for years, we've always had to look out at food banking from the developed world. And in 2019, we were fortunate to be at FBLI, my first of its kind, where we had the opportunity to say to GFN that it is about time that food banking in Sub-Saharan Africa is taken serious because there is a lot of food going waste along the supply chain. And COVID gave us that real opportunity in as much as it's a disaster, it gave us that opportunity to prove not just to uh, uh, our beneficiaries, but to various, various stakeholders within our food supply chain that indeed food banking is that center that holds where there's excess food with those that don't have. Today, Food for All Africa, right from COVID last year, we were able to serve over 100,000 beneficiaries through various programs. We were able to serve three million meals, and today we run one of the largest and largest school feeding initiative that is private sector led in supporting vulnerable children from community schools that don't have any means of nutrition during school hours. But then as well, we also create employment opportunities for some of these mothers. And for me, being at FBLI this year is another opportunity to learn more and especially given the challenges that we face. And thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you for being here, honestly. Um, and you know, and I gotta give props to Tony for putting this panel together, along with a whole bunch of other things that Tony and the team uh, do, does. So our, yep. You did good, Lisa, you did good. So first question, Sylvia. We all know how Chep uh, Brambles is such a huge leader in the industry, and if, you know, Chep, we're talking pallets, right? So we are all affected in some way, somehow, by that, uh, and especially um, during the past few years. So can you share a little bit how your clients have been impacted uh, really by the supply chain disruptions and how the disruptions really rippled out to affect uh, our customers? Well, uh, I, I guess the, the name of the conference couldn't be any better, no? Asia volatility, because it was not only COVID, uh, but also now uh, in the recent time with the, the war in Ukraine and, and, and Russia, uh, and now inflation, that we have seen everything that is, uh, is uh, disrupted, right? Uh, so uh, how that has affected our customers, uh, uh, in, in our case, and thank you for, for mentioning that, uh, that we provide uh, pallets in a, in a pooling uh, um, as, as a mean of a rental. So we have to do a lot with food because most of our customers are, are, are with, uh, within food. So what we have seen is um, since the, 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 the rise of COVID, 
uh, poverty levels uh, rose, and that changed dramatically also patterns of consumption uh, all over the place. So it was not only, you know, the fact that there was a timber uh, scarcity, but also changes in the consumption that, that framed different ways of uh, moving products from one place to, to the other. Then, of course, we saw also the impact of e-commerce uh, growing at a dramatic uh, rate, and, and that also changed the, the way all the goods were moving from one place to, uh, to, to another. And then, and then also uh, we saw uh, natural disasters, how they are affecting uh, the, 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 the supply chain. And they are not affecting only, only because they impact consumption or they impact the supply chain uh, specifically, but also uh, in our case, we, we, uh, we source our, our raw materials from, from nature. Uh, so anything that happens, you know, we just uh, were talking about the fires in, in Chile. So uh, our main source uh, of raw material is affected also by that. So that goes and passes on to, to, the, full, to, the, to the full chain. So um, that affected all over, all over the, 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 the companies uh, with all these changes in consumption, sources of materials, uh, growth of uh, e-commerce. So it, 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 it generated uh, uh, big changes in, uh, in patterns uh, that we have ne haven't seen before. Yeah, so true. And, and really, you know, who knew toilet paper was going to be the thing in 2020, <laughs> right? We needed pallets to put. If anybody could still answer why toilet paper, you know, you, 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 you'd answer the, I think, the question of the century, right? But I, I think that's a lot of, that's, you, you kind of led into the disaster part too because aside from dealing with COVID, aside from seeing all the mass distributions across the globe, mm -hmm. we still had to deal with natural disasters. Yes. And we were still counting on you to pull from all that. Every food bank, every company. So, you know, thank you for, for keeping up. <laughs> <laughs> Juan, Carlos, Juan Carlos is up next. So being the largest food company in the world, how have this, these disruptions impacted Nestle's ability to get food to consumers? Well, Danny, um, of course, uh, uh, the, the first issue is how, how to, to keep moving, no? Uh, how, how to maintain the, the business as usual, uh, the business continuity with the, with the disruptions. And first, it, it was uh, an issue of all our suppliers, you know, our, uh, our, our suppliers of raw materials. If you can imagine, we buy uh, fresh milk, for instance, in Mexico for more than 3,000 people every day. So it, it, we still had to buy those products that needed to be uh, 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 transformed. And if you can imagine this worldwide, uh, we said, well, well let, let's, let's start uh, stacking all the product that we can because we need that, they, uh, that the farms don't uh, actually stop, no? And we're in the food chain, so we need to make sure that, uh, that, that the resilience and the vulnerability that we had with, with all our, our, our people, the frontline people in, in the plants, no? Because uh, for many of us, it was easy to go and work from home. But being in the distribution centers and being in the in the plants, uh, n not knowing what's going to happen to you, no, that that you you were putting your life out there uh, uh, to produce. So so the responsibility that we had was to make sure that our colleagues were fine, that uh, uh, they they were not sick. Uh, thankfully, the the rate of of people that actually died it was very very low worldwide. Uh, but of course, the responsibility and the vulnerability that we had to say, okay, now we have the product, we need to start uh, uh, stacking the product, not only raw materials, but packaging and, and all, the, all the food and, and start using e-commerce. No? It was something completely uh, uh, unimaginable, no? And, uh, and well, of course, everyone has talked about the, uh, about the crisis of, for, for the containers. Uh, and the prices of, of food and everything, but at, at the end, uh, we were able to manage, 
uh, we had to change our plans of what we were producing because we had to produce whatever we had in place, not whatever we want to produce. No? Uh, and some of those products, of course, are our are first need, like uh, uh, powder milk or soluble coffee. So, so it, it, it was a, a, a big issue for us to try and maintain uh, uh, business as usual. And, but, but together with all the partners, we were able to, to manage and, and, and keep focus on, on, uh, on the suppliers first. No? And I, I, you know, really kind of led into this, and, and I'm, I want to say a big thank you to first responders during this whole time. I see all of you as first responders, and again, essential workers, because really everyone on your teams, it wasn't like we couldn't take a day off. We, we still had to, yeah, we laid low for a little bit, but then all of a sudden we had to ramp back up regardless. Um, and the business models changed. And if you weren't ready at that point, then you were gonna be behind the curve. And luckily there, there was enough of the businesses to be able to say to, to shift and to pivot and to, and to actually react to the market. So really, again, thank you for, for keeping our shelves stocked because one of the first things that food banks were asking was that how we can help was by able to keep our store stocked. And again, without pallets and without product, that would not be, we wouldn't be able to do. All right, Elijah. So, you know, in these disruptions impacted Ghana, and plus, you also had a change financially uh, within your region. How, can, you, can you talk about that and uh, what the effects were for sure. you and how you reacted to them? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so being an emerging, emerging food bank in the height of COVID, we became a star in bringing food to vulnerable people. And for us, it was an opportunity we've always looked out for to prove the importance of food banking. However, when we realized that not just COVID, but we live in a world where things can change at any moment in time. Just by when we were over the glory for the good job we've done, Ghana, with a country of 33 million, we were faced with the issue of the dollar rising so high that one dollar equivalent to our currency within six months increased over 150%. And what it meant then was that quickly what we as a country that depends so much on import, especially in the area of food product, means that the price of food, whatever increase that the dollar is bringing to the price of food, definitely is going to be pushed onto the final consumer. And that quickly brought in the challenge of having to look at how we as a food bank will be ready to support and change the means through which we provide support for our beneficiaries, not only depending, for instance, uh, food products like corn, corn, grains that were known to be staple food for low income and low income communities, people from very low income families. All of a sudden, the prices just kept increasing, basically because of the challenge that the disruptions in the supply chain has brought about. And most often, uh, the excuse that we had, especially from people in power, had always been that definitely the uh, Russia and Ukraine war affecting the availability of fertilizer and affecting the smallholder farmer who produces these food products that are much affordable to the mostly the low income people. And for us as a food bank, what it meant to us then as well to do was that we needed to look at innovative ways of looking beyond other sectors of the food supply chain and then working with community-based groups in order for food to get to communities where the disruption in, our, in the food supply chain has affected them. And we had to adapt to virtual food banking in some communities where we had to now go to 
these communities with the needed support. Whereas at a point we were mostly in city centers and then they come to us, we realized we need to scale our activities to move to them because then the availability of food for them becomes even more of a challenge. The model changed yeah. tremendously. And that's a good segue for Julie on the disruption, right? So how did that have an impact on your food bank, you know, then, and did it affect you really kind of a long term? And have you kind of made, because of those changes, pivots, right? Have you kind of made that a, a, a new way of doing food banking, handling food banking? You know, we used to talk about when things would get back to normal. And then we said when things would get back to better, because we were trying to be very optimistic. And then we said it's just all a new better, right? We all have to get to a new better. So for my food bank um, around food supply and other household and personal items, we typically, pre-pandemic, would get 80% of that donated to us. 80% and we'd get about 10% from the government and we'd buy 10%. So that was the old way. As soon as COVID hit, we saw that disrupted massively. Um, first, the US government leaned in very heavy into providing a lot of food out to food banks, which was terrific for my food bank. We were able to triple the amount of government food we were getting out through the system. We desperately needed it because donations were so disrupted. Um, particularly in the early days, the retail sector, the grocery stores, those plummeted, those went down, and they went down very fast. Thankfully, they did start to recover. Manufacturing and the food that we get donated from the agricultural system, um, that also went down, and that has been much more slow to recover to, for us. Um, unfortunately for us and for many food banks in the United States, um, that government's food has almost disappeared. So we are back to where we were pre-pandemic in government food or even less. This year we're actually anticipating having less government food than we've ever had in my 14 years at the food bank, which is pretty incredible. Um, donations are coming back to us. We have a very robust retail program. It's something that happens a lot at um, food banks within the United States where we go out into stores and we're gleaning that food some is done by the food bank, much of it, most of it is done by our food pantry partners. And we have been leaning hard into that. And so we've gotten that back to pre-pandemic levels and we're seeing it actually click up a little bit, which is awesome and we're so grateful to our re retail partners. Um, as I mentioned, manufacturing, that has been much slower to come back and that's all around um, supply chain, right? That's all around what are the, do we have aluminum for cans, right? Do we have glass for bottles? Um, we are seeing some of that come back now, but that is not back to where we were. And then um, a, little, a little fun fact about Illinois, 2% um, of our crops are specialty crops. So gosh, I wish we had great ag agriculture in my region. We don't. Um, most of what we grow is for feed, corn and so soybeans. So for our um, produce, we're really having to look differently at how can we bring in produce, how can we bring that in fairly within our food bank system, where else can we go to get, get what we need? Um, I, I do think the volatility, I do think the uncertainty is what we're all grappling, grappling with and we will continue to grapple with that for years to come. And unfortunately, I do think it means for our neighbors, I mentioned how much we want to get the food our, neighbor, our neighbors need and want, what is nutritious, what is culturally affirming for them, and we're finding that to be more and more of a challenge. Um, so what we're doing is we're leaning hard into purchase food. Um, that has grown from about 10% up to 25% of the food we're distributing we're buying. It is not sustainable. We have tripled our purchase food budget. Um, we are looking at who are those suppliers that we can count on. How do we need to shift with those suppliers? Um, we hope to be able to stay, sustain this level for the next two to three years, thanks to the generosity of our communities, but it's, it's really questionable for us right now. Yeah, you, you, hit, it, you hit that right, and, you know, as a retailer, um, our program donating at store levels um, and at the warehouse levels really, really just started to shim off. Um, and it, it put us in a really different type of position where we're always trying to say, you know, Brian, what do you need, Brian, today? Or, you know, Eric, what do you need? What does, you know, the Texas network need? Um, and it's food. And we were put in a position where we tried to make those 
um, matches with our suppliers and our vendors, but the product wasn't there. And it was really, really hard to, to grasp that. And, you know, is, uh, but luckily we've, we've come back, you know, and, and we're, we're looking at doing more produce and, you know, trying to get um, our donations back to where they were. But uh, it is a challenge. Okay, Sylvia, you ready? All right. What are you seeing related to when and how surplus food is becoming available due to disruptions in the supply chain? Well, I guess, I guess surplus is limited, right? So um, I would say that there is the traditional perspective where you would see, you would be catching almost at any opportunity that you, you, can, ever, you can ever get, no? But I guess this is, this is the time to be more smart and agile to think uh, how we catch on the, on, the, on the silver linings. Because we have talked about inflation in, in some of the places. Inflation affects to a, to a portion of, um, uh, of, of, of the consumption. But then, then of course, there is, there, there is going to be food that people will not be a, a, affording to buy. So how, how would you allow the access through technology, through faster services, through collaboration to get access to, to that, I guess, that is, uh, that, is, uh, that is important. And of course, country to country is going to be, it, it will still be on the age of volatility. So uh, no, I, I am afraid not, not to bring good news for what we see is going to be this year and the coming year. Uh, for uh, for for al for the globe, I would say, so um, catch on seasonalities, uh, follow follow what uh, what is happening with inflation, because uh, I guess those those are the, the the opportunities we would have to be trying to 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 catch. Yeah, we're still going to have to pivot. It, regardless, we're still going to have to try to react to to what's happening out in, yes. in the globe. So. Juan Carlos, that's a good question uh, leading up to you as far as for food banks. Um, do they need to know, you know, with these changes and the impact and the quantity available uh, of surplus food, what do food banks really need to know? What can you enlighten them with? Well, I would say the first thing is adaptability, no? Uh, to live with the uncertainty, uh, I believe that that's going to be the constant. The only thing that we can say that it'll be constant for the next few years is going to be change. So uh, basically to, to, to have the adaptability to, to look for in different places, I do believe that there's a lot of opportunity still uh, when, when you work uh, with the food loss food waste and you still see that 30% of the food that is produced is still wasted, no? Uh, I mean, I do believe that we have a, 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 a long way to go in this part. Um, I believe that uh, uh, not uh, single supply chains, but uh, com uh, it'll be less complex, and I believe that we will still have the opportunity to use mixed supply chains, meaning that the, the, the uh, the food uh, sellers will help us, the companies, instead of going directly or coming back to us and then we go directly to the food banks. I believe that there's an opportunity to, to, to see how we can manage this better for freshness and for availability. No? Uh, now, uh, of course, supply chains, instead of, of being so uh, global, they start to be much more regional or much more local. No? Uh, and maybe some programs will, will start to, to focus on the first needs of the people that are in our supply chains. Meaning, uh, for instance, uh, uh, before I would go to 100% of the food banks in Mexico and now I'm going to the food banks near where my plants are or to the food for farmers where the farmers of the coffee growers or the milk farmers are. So I believe that there, there's going to be a change in uh, the, the products available in different regions, no? Okay. So we still need to kind of, with sustainability being talked about nowadays, right? We still need to look at better ways how we can, and, and not just from, from you, it's from retailers too as well, you know, how do we not send 
product to waste. You know, there's still so many opportunities out there and really appreciate the both of you to be able to connect in those, in those particular areas of the world that you're in with food banks to those folks to be able to access to that product because we know it all goes a long way, you know? Um, so with that, Elijah, we know that you're a, a fairly brand new food bank. So how logistically, you know, we, we do know that there's a lot of things going into food bank logistic models. And are you considering implementing or, you know, perhaps making better anything that you're doing now, such as virtual food banking or direct distributions? Sure, sure, thank you. So as a new and growing food bank, especially in the region of the world, which is Africa, where food banking is still novel, we're trying to build a food banking model that really works for Africa and it's community oriented. For us, building partnerships at the local level is, is, has been very critical, especially with stakeholders within the food supply chain looking at the different sectors of our food supply chain and where opportunities are. For instance, the agri sector, quite recently, about a week ago, the Danish Embassy, uh, through a research they carried out with different stakeholders, revealed that $1.4 billion, $1 billion worth of uh, fresh yam Yam is a staple crop of Ghana. It's lost in, in Ghana each year. And there are, that clearly shows that uh, where we've had government concentrate more in the area of food loss, thinking that to overcome the challenges of, of food insecurity, it's more about increasing production. We have come to the fore to let stakeholders know that the issue of food insecurity and hunger is more about building partnerships to enable food banks at the community level have the needed infrastructure. And for us, leading the four as a new, as a young food bank, which other, other young initiatives look up to, we always want to make sure that we leverage on the logistics that we have available, the technical know-how that we receive through the global food banking network to be able to build resilience in the face of the disruptions that we face within our food supply chain. And for also having the opportunity to leverage on a network of other similar initiatives within the region, like in Kenya, in Nigeria, I'm able, as a small food bank in Ghana, I'm able to get in touch easily with my colleagues in Kenya, with my colleagues in Nigeria, to know if they're facing similar situation and how we share best practices and know how to us overcoming most of these challenges. Awesome. Well, you know what, you kind of weighed into the, how GFN's helping you? So that was gonna be my question. Is GF, what's GFN doing to help you you know, as far as moving ahead. So uh, I'm, I'm, that's something really, really I'm glad to hear um, because I know a lot of other food banks that are out there really uh, want to know and feel good about GFN and the work that they're doing. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Julie, um, what about your food banking? You know, being, have you incorporated new things, mobile distributions, bigger distributions? Or, or have, has that model changed with you? In terms of distributing the food, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we know that folks, neighbors who are seeking help don't always come to us because they don't know about us, they can't get to us, or they're ashamed. And so for us, how we distribute the food to the consumer, to the neighbor seeking help, is really important. And so certainly at the beginning of COVID, like so many food banks, we had mass distributions. We called them pop-ups. They were, you know, we were serving up to 2,000 families over a two to three hour period and they would drive through and get the food that was pre-packed in a box for them. Um, we are continuing that model. We have talked with our neighbors, we have surveyed our neighbors. We know that that highly anonymous, very quick, I don't have to make a huge commitment to getting my food, even though I don't have choice, is something they really desire. Um, but then there's shopping, right? And there's choice. And we've been able to bring that back. That was closed down 
for a period, but we've been able to bring that back. So folks can come back into our food pantries, our food bank owned food pantry, and they can shop and get the food they need. But also it requires some time and it requires some information. We're gonna ask them for information that we need to report to the government. Our largest innovation is around providing groceries online. So very similar, right? We keep watching what HEB and all these wonderful retailers are doing, right? And how we are all getting our groceries. And we know that ordering online and picking them up at a time that's convenient for us or having them delivered to us is really important. And so together with Feeding America, we launched an online food pantry. We call ours mypantryexpress.org. We have 35 to 40 shelf stable items and then we add on additional produce, protein and dairy for our neighbors and they can place an order and that order will be fulfilled um, for them and then they can pick it up at a local distribution site. It could be a food pantry, it could be one of our food bank sites um, or it's a Walmart store or a Goodwill store and we did that to remove stigma, right? If I'm going to my Walmart, I may not feel so embarrassed, right? Because I go there all the time for other things. Um, we also have delivery, which is being provided to us by DoorDash, and we're looking at some other ways as well. So we have seen that grow um, from, gosh, about you know, 75, 80 orders a week. We're now doing 1,900 orders a week. Um, we're gonna fulfill almost 90,000 orders this year and provide about three million meals through that. That's awesome. So you're tailoring. Right. We're totally, yeah, like I said, we're just trying to do what you all are doing. Because yeah. <laughs> everyone deserves that, right? Yes, yeah, you're right. Everyone yeah, deserves right. that, right? Everyone Everybody deserves that. Deserves Thank you, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and I think really one of the, the, the best things you know, to come out of COVID, um, as far as, you know, we love working with Feeding Texas, our food banks in Texas, but there's also other, um, certain areas of opportunity, right? We've been working with colleges um, because there's a huge need for students right now. Um, and there's a lot of work being done within the colleges setting up pantries. And some of these pantries are, they, fall, they do fall under um, the Texas food banks. But to be able to help sponsor some of these pop-ups at the uh, colleges, um, as far as a retailer, and that, that means a lot to us. Uh, we look for those different opportunities um, and see, you know, we're asking how the food banks can get creative. And then once we find something that, and we've we looked at it and you guys have done it, and it's something, hey, let's, let's continue to do this. So um, uh, my thing to the food banks is continue to be creative. You know, um, uh, we love the, that you guys are getting out into the rural areas. Wheels are our friend, you know, um, and we just, Again, applaud all the work that you guys have done. So with that, for all the, uh, for all the panelists here, we're gonna do a rapid uh, fire on this question. And we're gonna start off with Juan Carlos. If you had a crystal ball, what is one prediction you would make about changes that will occur in the supply chain in the next one to two years? I hope that crystal ball is really clear. I don't have a crystal ball, but I would say uh, shared Supply chains. I believe that sustainability is bringing us to understand how we can better manage shared supply chains. I believe that we understand that together we're better and that it's an era to, to share, not to compete. No? Uh, sadly, sometimes it has to come to, to disasters or to this kind of of crisis to understand that uh, we need to be together and everyone has its place. Uh, but I believe that sharing and, and, and doing things together, even uh, because it, it, it makes sense, uh, uh, you, uh, you have less resources. Uh, no, because if you say, well, digital and e-commerce, well, yeah, but some things you still have to go and put them in some place and, and produce in other place. So, so yeah, uh, uh, technology is not going to help us in, in all those ways, but it can help us, technology will help us uh, uh, bring those uh, uh, shared supply chains to a better use and for, for, for all sizes, not only for, for, for small businesses, but I believe that it's going to be even for big businesses that we will start using those 
shared supply chains, and that will help us have uh, It's not a one-size-fits-all situation. Yes. So, appreciate that. Sylvia? Well, that's a very interesting question, because um, I see three things that are going to be converging. One is very important, it is what, uh, what uh, Juan just, just mentioned and, and, and Elijah in some way, that we see that it's going to be an age of collaboration. We don't, we don't see uh, that, uh, how we can walk away from that, but how we can strengthen ourselves by, by collaborating. Um, and, and in fact, uh, it is part of what we are trying to do. And collaboration can come in many ways. For example, us as responsible of a portion of the supply chain, it is enhancing transport collaboration, for example, no? Uh, think, for example, that Nestle is launching one product that has to go to, uh, from point A to point B, and we are supplying the medium to, to get from A to B. Uh, and perhaps a competitor is going from A to B at the same time, okay? So why not sharing that, that transport that will diminish, you know, uh, the, the, the cost of, uh, of uh, servicing, and of course, it will diminish also the impact in the, in the, in the atmosphere uh, as a result. So that is just one form of collaboration, and we are, we are already piloting some, some of that around the world to see that happening through, through technology. So, so one, one is collaboration. The second is, of course, uh, moving to more sustainable, uh, supply chains. Um, we as CHEP uh, think of our operation, we have over three, 360 million pallets around the world moving all the time. So um, how we regenerate, how we make them more efficient, how we uh, collect them in a, in a best way that uh, we keep them moving and not using uh, as more resources as we currently do. Uh, and of course, how that optimizes, how the pooling optimizes, uh, you know, uh, CO2 reduction, waste reduction. So we see in sustainability that uh, models will become circular, more circular from time to time, and we will have to uh, to be closer to the operations, as as they mentioned, uh, to be to be more on, on on the spot. And then and then finally the age of uh, digitization. Uh, we see that through digitizing, for example, our product, we will be able to see how the products are moving, what are the times that are, 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 are involved in that, uh, what are the best routes the product can be moved. And again, as we are dealing with food, uh, if we are able through technology to understand the flows of the food, we will diminish waste. Uh, we will improve uh, time to market. Uh, so we see all those three things converging. Collaboration, uh, circular models, and then finally technology uh, uh, put in the service of, of, a, of a more agile and more, more, more uh, quick supply chains. It's all about efficiencies. Yes. Right? We're, we're all trying to be as efficient as we possibly can, but also trying to be good to mother nature. But I, I do love the piece that you're working with, um, I'm not gonna say your, your competitors, <laughs> to be able to find the, the common ground, right? Yes. And, and, and I think in our world, if we look at it on the retail side, we're not, there's no comp com competition between us, a Walmart, a Kroger, uh, when we're talking about donating food. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a price of doing business, and yes. as, as a price of that, you're gonna have shrink. And, if you're able to donate it to somebody who can be able to put it on their table, then that's the right thing to do. So I really appreciate Thank that. You. All right, Julie, you're up for the question. Sure, um, so definitely not being a supply chain expert, I chose to look up some facts, because um, as some folks in the audience, Emily Ma knows, I love my data. <laughs> um, so I found a study by COPA, which is a business spend management company, and they said in 2022, four out of five organizations saw one significant supply chain disruption. Four out of five of our companies, 80% of us. 50% um, of us saw three or more significant supply chain disruptions. That was last year. 82% of the supply chain leaders that they surveyed said that they expect the supply chain challenges to at best stay the same but most likely worsen. 
So holy cow, right? Um, that, that was a little sobering to me. Um, so many of those disruptions are around transportation, which we know, often driven by labor, um, driven by um, capacity, dis um, dis other disruptions. Um, also the shortage of, of goods, shortage of goods. And we have seen that so much, right? Food, gas, computer chips, and it's disrupting us so much. And so when I, I thought about it, and I thought about as the receiving end, don't get so efficient, please, Sylvie. Please don't get so efficient. <laughs> Keep some inefficiencies in your system because we benefit from them, right? Uh, but as someone on that end, I thought it just is going to drive us to think more strategically about how we might pivot as these things come to us, right? We have pivoted so well over the last three years. Um, we have looked at every opportunity and figured out how we might continue to get the food our neighbors need and want and get it back out as systems globally. And so I just think for us, we're going to have to be smarter. We're going to have to lean into partnership. We're going to have to really make sure we're maintaining our relationships and find um, continued um, strength, right, determination to, to pivot as we need. Chef? Well, who, are, who, are, who would have thought that the last three years would show to us, especially uh, Africa, that challenges in any part of the world can quickly have its effect on us, uh, wherever we find ourselves as middle-income, low-income countries. And it brings to the fore the importance of we having to hone up to the challenges that disruptions within our food supply chain brings. I think on a continental level, the African Union through the African uh, after trade agreement with its headquarters in Ghana have taken a step. However, I believe there's more to be done, especially in the area of inclusiveness, in the area of efficiency, in the area of not just looking at it from the business perspective, but as well the social benefits that lead to the most vulnerable in society. And for us, it's a good opportunity to have organizations like GFN helping food banks on the African continent. But then it also brings us that responsibility to hone up uh, ensuring that we're not just learning food banking, but we are creating a food banking model that can be honed by communities on the continent. Because obviously GFN will not provide support for, to Food for All Africa or Food Bank in Kenya with the expectation that we learn food banking and expect to get excess produce from, let's say, Liket Israel or get from other developed food banks, as it has always been when it comes to the area of uh, food dependence on the continent from other parts of the world. So for us as food banks, uh, owning this, seeing the opportunity of this and the support we are receiving from uh, GFN as a responsibility to take the conversation to our local communities, to our local authorities, leaders, and then as well, bringing it onto the continental level and forging that same partnership to see that the solution that food banking brings to vulnerable people in society is sustainable and as well is a means to ensure efficiency within our food supply chain. So you're digging in deep, that's what you're saying? Yeah. Julie, you're digging in deeper? Yes. Yeah. All right. So I, th I think really the, 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 the honest thing is that we are going to have to dig deep. And if you think you've dug as deep as you can, well, you haven't. You need to dig some more. It's still there. And, and again, um, Sylvia Juan Carlos, thank you. Because I know there's not one person up here or in here that goes to bed not thinking about what's tomorrow. Uh, especially in the supply chain issues. Um, so thank you for everything that you, that you do, your companies do, because I know um, you, both of you are well respected in your, in your fields. You're welcome. Now we have a little bit of time for some uh, questions. Um, 
and I'm not too sure if anybody's going to be able to get you truckloads of Nestle uh, hot chocolate here <laughs> really quick, but um, yeah, please, if you have a question, just wait for the mic. Somebody will get to you. I think we see somebody over there. Hey, uh, Brian from uh, Houston. Uh, not a question, but you know, I, I, I love the tone of the, the, the conversation, challenges in the supply chain. Um, in, the, in the late 80s, my first conference, national conference in the U.S., uh, there was a panel called The Food Industry Speaks, and uh, it was representatives from major food companies, and they all told us the exact same thing, that they all said the same thing with each other, that we're going to get less food, that they're getting more efficient and the opportunities are going down. Any food bank that bet on that horribly underserved their community as a result. I mean, the reality is it's the optimists that build the world, and there's still so much opportunity, so hopefully everybody's taking out the positive that it's, yeah, there's pivots, there's changes, but there's lots of opportunity for us to help our neighbors far more. Thank you, Brian. I know there's some questions rolling out there. Gracias. Esta, sí. Buenos días. Eh, Mariana Jiménez, directora de Alianzas e Inversión Social de la Red BAMEX. Muchas felicidades. El panel. From the social partnerships of the BAMEX network. Maria Jiménez from the BAMEX network. Very interesting panel. We understand that in nature, the species that don't adapt to change uh, disappear. I, that applies today to organizations and mainly organizations like food banks that depend on uh, supply chains. I have a question for Juan Carlos. Number one, I want to thank you, Juan Carlos, for the partnership that we have with BAMEX uh, at the national level and at the global level with Nestle and the, the hope that you bring to the families that we serve. But I want to ask you, as a company, and with all the changes that you are seeing uh, coming in the horizon, and of course, in the, the pretty short term, how do you believe that we as food banks need to adapt to continue to be inserted strategically, strategically in your uh, shared uh, value chain or shared supply chain? That the issue is that food producers or, or, or big companies are not the only ones that need to be in your supply chain. For instance, 30% of the, of, the, of, the, of the food that is lost, it's in the first mile or the first uh, part of the, of the supply chain. I've always said that uh, having a, 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 real a, a real cooperation with uh, farming uh, associations could help a lot to bring more of those products that are actually uh, not being uh, 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 I mean it's it, it, the, we're not used to bringing that as much as we can no there's another third part that it's after consumption uh, that, because the food banks are, are doing a, a great job first with, with, with industrialized food then with the, with, with, the, with the farming or, or coming from farms, but I still believe that there, there's a space where we can, we can even help you, no? Our companies with our supply chains can help you food banks because we're already bringing a lot of product from the farms into the, the production sites or to cities. So I think that there's something that we can do there. That's, that's a good for an offline conversation. You know how, how you guys were able to to connect together on that yeah. as well. Any more questions? You're letting them off too easy. No. Yeah, sort of. uh, Perhaps just following on, on on the question that was just raised, I guess that also um, as companies will tend to become more efficient. Uh, uh, that is that is an undeniable truth. So I guess that how we are shifting uh, the corporate thinking towards uh, adopting the necessity to support the community. So I guess I guess that uh, it, it doesn't fight uh, how you how you become efficient, but how you build 
a common understanding on your role in society and on your role in the community and how you plan to help. So, so for example, in our case, we are pullers, we have pallets, we don't, we don't manufacture any, any food, but we are conscious that through education and through the voting, a portion of our, our p uh, to support food banking and to support uh, communities is part of our good corporate citizenship. So I guess we will have as companies to shift towards that as we move into a more efficient system. that are requesting that help from companies um, to be sure to align with the business priorities, right? Um, that's why yesterday's conversation about carbon footprint and environmental impact, so important, right? So how can we align to a company? So many companies have adopted zero waste, right? How do we show them that we are effective in helping the company meet that goal? Like that's incumbent on us um, and, and to have small prayers that every once in a while there's an efficiency glitch. <laughs> Sí, buenos días a todos. Eh, Daniel Tapia, de director. Good morning, everyone. I'm Daniel Tapia, I'm the director of the food bank in Culiacán, Sinaloa, Mexico. In our bank, we have uh, issues. We have um, a lot of agricultural uh, production in our state, but over a thousand tons of produce is wasted every day. So we're working on our infrastructure. We need to have uh, more warehouses, more storage facilities. But the question is, what does logistics, transportation, what role does it play? How uh, significant is the role of logistics, particularly transportation? How feasible do you see uh, it? How feasible do you think it is for a food bank to have their own transportation fleet? I think uh, one major reason why most of companies would want to throw away food has to do with considering the uh, logistics challenge that comes into play. So for a food bank, uh, bringing this food, connecting this food to vulnerable populations uh, one of the key elements of your, uh, uh, your operation has to do with the transportation, getting the food to the beneficiaries. And in communities where we serve, for instance, in Ghana, uh, it's one thing to go collect the food, it's another thing to get the food to the beneficiary because uh, the beneficiary doesn't even have the means of transportation to come to your facility to get the food. So as a food bank, it brings in the challenge of not just the, the transportation. When you talk about transportation, you're talking about the fleet, you're talking about fuel. And faced with increasing fuel crisis, uh, where prices of fuel keeps going very high, as a food bank, you easily also have to look to adapt into innovative ways that will ensure that you are still able be, you are still being able to get the food to the beneficiary at a cost that is quite lower and for us this past year it's one area that has made us start looking at our cost of distribution how we are able to effectively deliver more food support to more beneficiaries beyond uh, our reach, uh, but at the same time, doing it, uh, look, considering cost of that distribution. And, and I'll add, I think it's very important to have a fleet that can provide the service to the company from which you're getting your food, right? I think it's really, really important to have a dependable, safe fleet so you can go out when you get that call, when you have that offer, and make sure you can get it because. You know, companies are bottom line driven as they should be, right? That's how they make themselves sustainable. And so they may not be willing to cover the cost of getting the food to you. Yeah. I think I, I kind of want to go back to the question really quick. We got a little bit of time left. But I think education is really a huge piece of this. Um, when you have new vendors coming up, um, you know, 
in your day-to-day -day workings and educating them about the food banks within their areas that they're working with and making those contacts, um, I think that's, that's really huge. Um, we, we try to do that when we're onboarding our, our new folks that are our, our vendors or who are coming up. And we always say, if, you, if there's any sort of excess surplus, which, you know, not a lot of lately, but really, you know, get in contact with me and we'll get in contact with the food bank and we'll get that. And I, I think there's some folks, um, I think with the HEB, uh, our grocery company, we were lucky enough to be able to have this, our hunger relief department developed under public affairs. So that is a pillar of, of our company, education, hunger relief. And I think if it, it, for me and my team going out there and knocking on our, our BDM's doors and saying, hey, if you got anything extra, remember, we got Brian out there in the Houston area, or we got, you know, San Antonio or the Valley. Uh, we're always thinking about that. So, uh, again, we're kind of almost out of time. But um, it, there any, there any other questions that are out there that uh, anybody wants to ask? Okay. All righty. Well, oh, got time for one more question, Tony? I'm sorry. Quick one. Quick one. Hi there. Ooh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm keeping everyone from the break. Hi there, Michael Jones from RAP, um, pr and proud partner of Pato Policomida. It was just uh, a question um, around, so we've been talking about disruption and volatility and the impacts of climate change, whether that be extreme weather, water stress, um, and uh, biodiversity loss, they're all becoming more evident, more frequent, more extreme. And we talked about the issue of adapting to those situations. I was just wondering how we not only adapt, but resurrect and indeed go further and incorporate climate into the, into the supply chain further and faster. I'm, I'm not understanding the question on that one, though. Uh, yeah, so obviously we're talking about adapting to right. conditions such as climate change. Okay. But how do we actually go further? No, we're not only just adapting to the issue, but we're actually resurrecting it. We're actually making the climate more favorable to en enabling production to happen at the pace, etc., that we want to. So it's just that, in thinking about the, the climate within the supply chain. How do we not only adapt to what the issues that we face now, but, but we improve the future? Well, in, uh, in, in the case of uh, our, our company, uh, our focus is on regeneration. So, uh, so we have already passed over uh, being net, uh, to providing applause to, to, to nature. So in the coming years uh, and, and at the present time, we are, we are planting more trees than what we are using currently. Um, so so that, is, that is our focus, to, to regenerate as much as possible, to be within the cycle of nature, optimizing energy, uh, and of course, shifting to, to, to renewable energy. That's, that's what, we are, what, what we are doing. Part of your sustainability program. Yes. There you go. All right. Well, we're going we're gonna to stop right there, and we're going to let everybody go to break. And I want to thank our panelists today. And if um, you see them around here, feel free to ask them any questions. Are we okay with that? Yes. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much.